no other person. We've given our honor and due credit to all of those in the scriptures that have followed you and shown us many things and done many exploits in your name. But you, Lord, Lord Yeshua, you are the one that we are to be your disciples. And for that, Lord, we give you glory, we give you honor and praise. And all of God's people that can agree with that said amen. Amen. So, um, Jamie, I didn't give it to you. I was supposed to you. But let's go to Matthew 28, 19 and 20. That's still our springboard because that's where the commission is. And today we want to take a little bit of a deeper look into our role and what we're supposed to be looking like. Because I think if we, if we clear that up and we start performing more like him, then the results that we're looking for is, will be so much better, right? How many of y'all can agree that Yeshua was blessed? Right? He was blessed. Moses was a tough guy. He put it down, right? Moses did great things. Elijah, Elisha, all the prophets, they did great things. <clears throat> but they all spoke of him. And then when he came, he put the emphasis on us doing what he said. Amen? So, of course, King James, he says, uh, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And for the sake of the streaming, I like Dr. Stern's translation much better. Therefore, go and make people from all nations into Talmudim, a student, a learner, Immersing them, immersing them into the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and remember, he's saying remember, I will be with you always, yes, even until the end of the age. I'll be with you. Immerse yourself into the teaching and instruction. Immerse yourself into the instruction and the explanation of the Torah that I gave. See, there's a lot of teaching and a lot of instruction, but he said teaching them to observe what I have commanded you. I'm going to say this. I hope no one's offended, but if they are, if they just think about it, they'll understand what I'm saying. Not every Christian, as we call ourselves, is a disciple. That doesn't mean they're not sincere. That doesn't mean that they don't believe God. But what it means is that they have not become a student and a learner. And that's a requirement to have the title, or I don't even like the word title, to have the function, because it's not a title, it's a function. You function as a student of the Messiah. So if he walked the earth and he had to deal with certain things within the religious right, and he had to straighten things out, and he would do that by making certain statements that was clearly understood in his day. <clears throat> and he would say things like, you have heard, or it's been said, but I say unto you, <clears throat> excuse me, because he's saying, I'm your teacher. We understood that there was disciples of different rabbis, and you were of the house of this one and of the house of that one. I'm of the house of Green. I'm of the house of Horge. I'm of the house, okay, but I say unto you, so he was saying, I need you to listen carefully because you've heard a lot of things. But I'm saying to you, this is what it is. 
Now, we have the option of accepting that or rejecting that. And every master teacher, every uh, apprentice can differ. And so there was some that we saw in the scriptures, when he said something that was difficult for them to accept, they left. Is that, is that happening today? Absolutely. Certain things are not going to be accepted, and when they're not accepted, people may turn away. They may come back. They may turn away. Churches move all the time. People come and go. That don't mean you left God. Nobody's accusing you of that. But what he wanted was for us to be together. When he stood at that place called the gates of hell and he said that my congregation, because of them knowing who I am, he said the gates of hell will not prevail against them. And so I'm saying to you all, become a student, and then I'm going to break this down a little bit about how that works, because we live in a society of instant coffee, instant everything. Everything happens now. Remember the old encyclopedias? Now, I remember my father bought these encyclopedias. He paid a lot of money. And I, he said, but y'all better be some smart jokers because I just paid a whole lot of money for them books. And every now and then, when we were getting in trouble, he would take us in the room and say, what did I buy all these? He was a colorful individual. And he said, what did I buy all these books for? And y'all getting in trouble. They collecting dust. And I paid a whole lot of money for them. But my point is, is that even with all of those volumes we had, Britannica and all that, you had to go in there and find what you were looking for. So it took some time. You get the index, you look it out. But now, all you have to do is pull that bad boy out and talk to it. Just say something. You say something and then it pops up. And there's some theories out there that that, thing is actually reading your brain waves and some things you thinking about all of a sudden you ever get ads that you know where this come from I was thinking about this and ad show up well there's some theories out there that this thing is designed to that it's scanning you every now and then Siri's talking to me I ain't saying nothing to Siri the phone is in the room and I'm talking and all of a sudden I don't understand that I'm like, ain't nobody talking to you Siri so what does that tell you it's listening to you. Now, see, we were talking about big brothers watching, man. You have no idea what military technology has developed in that thing you hold in your hand. It's listening to you. Amen? All right, but let's do something. So that's, that's the breakdown. And really, I think we lost that concept so much about these verses and what the, the meaning was because now we got all kinds of teaching. And, and understand this. <clears throat> I'm not attacking. I'm saying that for this branch of Zion, which I have the responsibility myself, Pastor Barry, to, to try to give you guys the right stuff, I say our focus is lost because a disciple and we're going to go through the scriptures, it's supposed to become like the one that's teaching them. Think about this, guys. And Lord knows, when I say this, it's going to strike a chord with everybody. Why do we miss Pastor Green so much? Why? Because what he taught, he did his best to live by saw him he was after that which he was trying to put in us amen I used to laugh sometimes I was like look ain't no way a man can fake it that long I've been watching him too long ain't no way he can fake it that long you know even if you had a show there's a curtain call right at some point but if you caught up with Pastor Joseph P. Green he was doing something and this thing here was either laying in his lap or he was watching something that was, he was trying to get more clarity on, right? <clears throat> so, listen to this. 
let's go to uh, the, well, the disciple, discipleship is a process of development, right? Can y'all say that with me? So I make sure y'all still with me. A process of development. It's a process. So if you stand at this altar today or anywhere, you give your life to Messiah and you say, hey, cover my sins, forgive me, and okay. So now you've just been moved, as we say, on the spiritual level, you've been moved out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now, does that mean you now shine in bright? No. It's a process, right? And I remember Mother Green talk, teaching some many years ago about signs of life, where you see, you know, like, if, if you planted seed in a, in, a, in a pot and you watering it and you're doing all that and, and nothing don't start coming up out of there, you figure something's wrong. It's signs of life when you saw it coming up and it beginning to grow and then it would sprout, bloom. All those are signs of life, right? Dead things don't grow. What they do is decay. They break down. So that's an easy way to figure out your own development. Are you sprouting? Are you growing? Are you flowering? Or are you decaying? And that ain't hard for you to figure out. Is my life getting better or is it getting worse? And if it's getting worse, you got to check and see what's going on. Amen? So, Matthew 10. Can I have Matthew 10, 24, 25? And this is a piece, um, <clears throat> I was looking at a couple of references this morning because I had read some things that I remember was pretty good from a particular teacher. Um, but 24 says, the disciple is not above his master. So that tells us right off the bat, we never going to get above Yeshua, right? So that should help us understand that we're not so special. Right? He said, well, not nor the servant above his master. Now, some people don't like this because Stern translates the slave. We don't like that word slave. But we know that the slavery in the scriptures is not, supposedly is not the chattel slavery we went, went through. But it says the Talmudine is not greater than his rabbi, his teacher. Right? And a slave not greater than his master. The point of it is, we're servants of God, so we'll never be above him. So we never seek to take the place of our master teacher, which is Yeshua, nor our father, God. But well, one thing, they're one and the same, right? So we're not, we're not battling with that. So we're not trying to deal with that. But know that this, it, it goes on to say, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. Now, the reason why I'll read Dr. Stern's translation in a second, but I like that this word as is here. That word as, you've heard me say this before, is a very powerful word in the English language because it means basically to the same degree, right? So he says as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house, and here's the thing, the master of the house, Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Now, I'm going to break this down because he threw the Beelzebub in there. Know that I'm pulling this particular scripture out to talk about something, but I want you to know as I'm teaching that this is in a particular context. So that means for you, you need to go back and read and find out the whole piece. But I can tell you what he was saying about Beelzebub is because at that time, the religious re believers at that time, when you read that, it's gonna, they were after him about the way he was teaching and things he was putting out. So they was trying to say Beelzebub, which was Baal, Beelzebub, which is, was a demon. Now, has anybody ever seen this bumper sticker that says, God saved me from your followers? I've seen it. If you haven't seen it, it's a bumper sticker, right? But this coincides to some of that because at that time, he was saying to them, 
that your disciples or your teaching is, is wrong, right? Would that transpire today that some may say that you, the, putting out the teachings and instructions of Yeshua is wrong? So they're saying now, if Jesus ain't no good, because that's all they're saying. If Jesus ain't no good and you're his disciple, how much more are they going to say to you? But he's making a comparison to help you understand that if they hate me, they're going to hate you. But here's the thing. If you don't look like him, teach like him, and talk like him, you might be all right. I can stand you, but that Jesus guy's got to go. But think about this, guys. You're saying you're following him. So if you're very acceptable to the worldly status, then maybe you're not following him as you should. See? Oh, he all right. He ain't too bad. He's letting you know, and it's given us some indication that if you okay with worldly circles, then... Maybe you don't look like him as you should. If you're so easily accepted into certain situations, then maybe not. It's something we got to understand because he's saying to us that I need you to develop so that you become more like me. Right? Now, that's a negative part because he's saying, hey, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. But on the positive side of that, people should be drawn to you because you look more like him. So it's, it, you're going to get both ends of it. If the people are drawn to you and you're able to assist was he not able to assist anyone that came to him? And you're able to assist them and then enlighten them to the path that they could walk on. That's a good thing. On the other hand, he's saying, be prepared to suffer persecution just like I did. Amen? So you got to understand this, this is a full, full circle, right? So this is talking in terms of transformation to be like Messiah with the same agenda as Messiah. And that's where things get a little cloudy today. Are the, are, is the body of Messiah maintaining the same agenda that he had? Might not be able to say hallelujah right now, but you got to think. Is it the same agenda? Can I have Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? Let's see. 28. Huh, this is a good one, right? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are very heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This translation says, come unto me, all of you who are struggling and burdened. Struggling and burdened. With what? Life. So the people you're looking for is going to be struggling and burdened in life. But not just that, but also those who are doing well, they need him too. Amen? Amen. And a lot of times we get off and we think that we're only supposed to deal with those that are poor and suffering. You know, everybody. Because imagine this. If you turn a billionaire towards the Torah and Yeshua, he could alleviate, he or she could alleviate some of the suffering of the poor. 
So it works both ways, right? And we also, that's why I was talking about, about us being able to compete. We are supposed to be, you know how we preach it, we the head and not the tail. Well, in this natural realm, there's things you're going to have to be prepared to do and to be proficient in in order to do that. Not everything is going to be that um, you pray and go check your, 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 your bank account and somebody put a million dollars in it. Am I saying that can't happen? No, I'm not. But if that was the case, I think we all be out of debt. So it ain't happening that much. If it is, I don't know. I ain't going there. But here, it's telling us who are struggling and burdened. He said, I will give you rest. And then he says this. He tells you how. You struggling, you're burdened. He said, I will give you rest. How are you going to give me rest, Yeshua? And that question may be asked of you. Take my yoke. And y'all know what a yoke is, right? A yoke is where you, you, know, you put the animals together and you yoke them together so that they can move the same way. They can't pull against each other or it doesn't work, right? So he said, take my yoke upon you. And then he says, and learn of me. Because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I'm going to hold verse 30 for a second. So ask yourself this. When you, when you are presenting that, uh, and the thing is, the gospel is a little swayed sometimes too. Because we say the gospel is Jesus Christ. But we use the term the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what is that really? It's not that he came, died, and rose. It's not. The gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ is the kingdom is here. So this is about kingdom. And that means this is about learning how to govern life inside of the rules of the Torah. And when that happens, you begin to flourish. And that's part of what my testimony was about. Ain't no way in the world I would have the life I have if I had maintained being a knucklehead. Right? Life should improve. So it's getting to the fact that this is the yoke you take. Take my yoke and learn of me because I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your soul. So ask yourself this question. Are you enjoying the fellowship of being a disciple? So there's a fellowship involved in this yoke. And that's the part I think we miss. It's not taking on all the laws and the rules solely, the things that you're teaching and instruction, but it's having fellowship with him because you are yoked with him. So just imagine yoking two oxen together that always fight each other when they're loose. And you yoke them two together. There's not going to be fellowship there. It's going to be struggle, right? The same as if you are not going to fall in agreement with Yeshua, you're going to have struggles. Struggle with what? Struggle with maintaining your development as a disciple. It's the same, it's no different than a father and a son that can't line up with each other. They're at odds. The father has wisdom, he has life experience, and he's trying to give it to his son, but they can't make it. What's going to happen? Is the father going to lose development? No. He's already walked the path, and he understands that the, the way you're going is not good, but it's the son, the one that has to be developed, is the one that's going to fall short. So for us, that's the same thing. Does Yeshua need us? Nobody wants to answer that question? Ah, but he does. If he didn't need us, he wouldn't have sent us. He needs us to do what? Because more could do than one. So he needs us. But the point of it is, 
We can't be, and that's why he gave that little parable about if the salt's lost its savor, it's, no, it's only good for what? Throw it down on the floor to keep the priests from slipping in the blood, and they'd be trampled over. So he needs us, but he needs us to develop, and so if we yoked with him, we got to have fellowship with him. And fellowship technically means to participate in the life of another believer. But he's our Messiah, so why not participate in the life? And that's why 28, it said, immerse them into the reality. Put them deep down in it, man. Make sure they're getting the instructions properly because they're going to need to have fellowship with me. So ask yourself, are you, in, are you enjoying the fellowship of being a disciple? What would that enjoyment be like? It would be like your life increasing and getting better amen even though when you have trials and tribulations the yoke is to guide and control your movement now some folks don't like that because I'm grown and I don't want nothing controlling me right but he's trying to control your movement because outside of him you step into paths and you step into things that you shouldn't go and what will happen to you in that matter so we lose right there. Amen? So, but also, he wants to control, Yah wants to control your direction. He wants to keep you on the path. And then, but discipleship involves this. And this is why I brought up Pastor Green. <clears throat> and just imagine, if we miss him, how much more should we want to desire to, to be with Yeshua? if a mere man gave us such a great example as a teacher, right? But if discipleship involves skills, you heard what I say? Skills. It, skills derived from a body of information that is demonstrated before you. Now, this ain't mine. I read that. I went to the reference because I read that in a, in a particular some material that Tony Evans wrote, and he's right. You need that example. That's one of the reasons why you don't forsake the assembly. You ever, you ever had somebody who isolates themselves and study the word all by themselves, and whatever they come up with, that's what it is. And they could be wrong as two left shoes. Well, this is what it says, and they've had no other frame of references. Pastor Green went through that when he was bringing about this Hebraic perspective and putting out information that people didn't know and had not understood. So they was thinking that he's teaching something strange. But come to find out, nah, he's moving into areas that you have not gone to. So therefore, now, you knocking it and you don't even know anything about it. Right? But remember that when you're talking to people and trying to get them to see that, hey, your life will be better with Yeshua, keep that in mind, that they don't necessarily have a frame of reference to what you're talking about. So that means you may have to adjust yourself and make sure you can meet them where they are. Amen? That's important because we run people off too much with thus saith the Lord. Well, they don't know nothing about thus saith the Lord. They don't know anything about that. All they know is I'm suffering and I'm having a hard time. And these are the ones he wants you to go after, but you have to do it the way he did it. He didn't run anybody off. Not that I saw. I could be wrong. But he didn't run anybody off. But he may ask a question that might cause you to say, nah, I can't do that. And, and you step away. But he didn't run anybody off. They ran themselves off after he gave them what was required to walk with him, right? Amen. Because he, you know, that wasn't it. And he did say, hey, in another portion, he said, I, I know y'all think I came to bring peace, but I'm not. The stuff I'm teaching is going to cause some division right in your household. A man's family is going to be his enemy because he's trying to go in a direction that they don't want to go. But that's not the same thing. So keep that in mind. It involves skill. Discipleship involves skills derived from a body of information that is demonstrated before you. 
That's why we miss pastors so much, you know. And unfortunately, sometimes, if you'll be honest, and don't raise your hand, but if you'll be honest, you may have a situation that you would love to talk to him about, but you can't because he's gone. He, he's done his time, and he's gone. And you think about him, well, I sure would love to talk to him. Well, that's why it was important to have that fellowship with him while he was here. And so when I look around and I look at all of you, I so treasure the time that I see you. And that's why I want it. And that's why my wife be like, well, come on, Jack, we got to go. But I want to spend some time with you because I want to make sure that I'm getting all I can get because I might not see you tomorrow. Amen? And I hope y'all feel that way about me. Amen? But that's, the, that's part of the fellowship, how they love one another, right? So, let's go to Romans 12. This Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, we are familiar with these. <clears throat> but I want to, I'm tying this to what I just gave you. Keep that in mind. We need each other because we need to be modeling this body of information before each other. And that's why we hold church leadership, we hold them in high esteem, but the truth is we're all just men and women, right? And we're trying to work this out, right? So we shouldn't be too hard, but we should be able to walk, right? Anybody can be corrected. Amen? Y'all agree with that? All right, but in some places you correct them and they throw you out. I beseech thee, therefore, by brethren, by the mercies of God, <clears throat> that you that ye present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but, ye, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you, King James. That thing hard to understand right there. You'd be like, huh? What did he say? Okay. So let's do it from a different place. I exhort you, and exhort means that I'm admonishing you, I'm saying to you, hey, pay attention to this, right? That's what exhort, when we say, I want to exhort the people, ah, it's just instructions. Hey, look at this, pay attention to this, right? I exhort you, therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercies to offer yourselves as a sacrifice. Right, we know what a sacrifice is, right? But notice what he said. A sacrifice. He knew back then and even to this day that when you say sacrifice, people, and you're talking to people, they immediately go to martyrdom. That's why I don't care what you're teaching. Ain't nothing going to cause me to strap a bomb to me and blow some folks up. Thinking about glory. Ain't going to happen. Nope. Not going to do that. Sorry. We got to figure out another way, homeboy. <laughs> I'm not doing that. But he says, he said, living and set apart for God. He broke it down, right? Up there is kind of, you know, living sacrifice, holy. Holy just means set apart. All right, so it don't mean squeaky cream. don't mean your breath don't stink in the morning. It don't mean none of that. It means set apart, Right? Don't mean that you sometimes make mistakes. It just means you set apart. Set apart for God, and he says, this will please him if you do what? Be a living sacrifice. In other words, die to the fleshly desires of a worldly mindset. Die to that. Crucify that. And be a living, walking around, working sacrifice for God. This will please him, right? So that means we're not just doing what we want. We don't have a sacred life and a secular life. We only have a sacred life, right? This will please him. And then look at this. I love this translation. It is the logical temple worship for you because religious people can get into some of the craziest ideas. Stuff that's not logical, doesn't make sense, and you think you're being holy. No, that's crazy and often irritating 
And if they follow you throughout the day, what you're saying right now, I'm going to find you're not doing that because you're human like everybody else, right? He said, this is the logical temple in our temple worship for you. Not the building temple, but the walking temple, you. In other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of Olam Haze, this present world. Don't let yourselves, watch this, don't let yourself be discipled by the world. Or society. Thank you, B. The world or society. Different cultures. We got all this stuff going on. But he's saying, I got a set of things I want you to follow. Because remember, what are we trying to be like? We're trying to be like him. Right? Instead, Keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you will know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. What that comes down to, if I can break it in the smaller pieces, right information that we talked about, demonstrated or modeled before you that's transforming and molding you and causing you to see changes in your life. Remember, that's why I love that teaching that mother gave on signs of life. If you are a person that gets angry quick and you start modeling yourself after Yeshua, studying his teaching and instruction, looking at the Torah, look what it says about anger, and you start to transform and calm down. Signs of life. But what is it also? Signs of spiritual development that you're becoming more like Yeshua. I got cursed out on a job one time as a supervisor, right? And the guy called me a, a bald head so-and-so. Well, I knew I'm being transformed because in most cases, I'm going to smack you in your mouth. But what I did, and I did it right in front of me, and I did it without it. I looked, I pulled my ID that hangs. I pulled my ID and I looked at it, and I said, well, that's incorrect. Because what you called me, I looked. Let me see if my name tag is saying something different. I looked at it and I said, uh, well, that's incorrect. And then I said to him, you need to calm down. It's not that serious. Let's go talk in the office. No, man, man, he kept on going. And he was calling me all kind of mothers and fathers and all that stuff, you know, and he was going at it. And I said, listen, man, you're creating a hostile situation. You need to calm down. And then he cursed me again, and I said, I tell you what. Curse at me one more time, and I'm going to put you on emergency placement under Article 16.7 of the Collective Bargaining Agreement, and I'll let you know when you can come back to work. What did I hit him with? It is written. And that joker came right on down. I'm, I'm saying that to you because I know me, and my wife is over there. She could tell me some years ago I'd have smacked him in the mouth. And then guess what? I would have lost my job because, number one, I'm a supervisor. And so now what we got is two employees violating the code of ethics and conduct for the United States Postal Service. One's a supervisor and one's an employee. We both getting fired. Because the scripture says anger does what? Rest in the bosom of a fool. So what I'm saying is, now, look what happened. I could have gave him what he gave me, but using the wisdom of God disarmed him completely. Because I, I wasn't about to say nothing else. I just told you what's about to happen. 
gonna call Henrico police, they're gonna come pick you up, and you're gonna be escorted out of here. And if you put your hands on me, I'm gonna take a few days off, because I ain't gonna let you kill me, but I'm gonna take a few days off, and then after this court, I'm gonna own you. I'm gonna get some of that money. If you got a, if you got a house, I'm gonna go after your insurance. Ain't that right, Pastor Barry? I'm gonna go after your insurance at your house. You got 300,000 on your house? Did you know that you could be sued on uh, your homeowner's policy if you assault somebody? How many people knew that? I know, I know he know an insurance man back there, but he could. His lawyer said, okay, he ain't got no money. Okay, sue his, sue his, uh, sue his, he got a house, sue his insurance policy from his house. And he gonna get that money, and guess what? And your insurance company gonna drop you after that. But you see what I'm saying? See, wisdom, what did the scripture say? Wisdom is the principal thing, right? But later on, some people walked up and said, man, I ain't never seen nothing like that, man. I got a lot of respect for you to handle it like that, because I would have, yeah, yeah, if I'd have handled it the way you said, I'd, I'd be walking out the door too. So what am I getting at, y'all? The signs of life is bringing you into agreement with the information as you watch the successful changes in your life over time. It doesn't happen overnight. So also that means we got to be patient with one another. Right? Whatever you're struggling with in a relationship is going to be based on mainly what you or the person that you're dealing with or both lack in your discipleship and development. Because if you mature, you can work it out. And this is what it means to say, with God, all things are possible. With what? With God's teaching and instructions, all things are possible within relationships. We're not talking about inanimate objects, right? I let the secret out. If I'm doing marriage counseling, I'm not testing whether y'all are ready to be married. I'm testing your discipleship. I'm asking questions the way, from this Hebraic perspective, I learned that if I'm doing marriage counseling, I want to find out where each other are in God. Right? Because today, we put the cart before the horse and we think we got the greatest thing since sliced bread. But then after, over time, you feel out you ain't got nothing. But what is it based on? Both believers, right? <laughs> All right. All right. This equals maturity. So that's why I made the statement that a lot of believers are not disciples because we got too much immaturity in the body of Messiah. Come on, y'all. Hey, listen, am I by myself? I'm not by myself, right? So we got to understand that we've lost the principle of the Great Commission. The principle was to become like him. He didn't say go out there and become great teachers that everybody would clap their hands when they see you. No, it was for you to become, teach them to become like me. And if you're doing anything other than that, you first growing yourself and you teaching others how to grow, then you're missing the whole thing. And you're going to be held accountable, especially if you took that oath and the charge that me and Pastor Barry and Deacon Greg them to ordain is ordained. That means that your work was sanctioned by men so other men could look to you for discipleship. Come on, y'all. Now, if y'all ain't going to say amen on that, That's why we miss our teachers so much. We knew what he was committed to. And it was a great sacrifice to him and his family. A 
A vote one four says, let your house be a meeting place for the wise, set amidst the dust of their feet and drink in their words with thirst. Put yourself in the place with wise men and women. That means men and women that know the scriptures and demonstrate that knowledge. Hang out with them. Now, it's unfortunate that many haven't had that. So when you, and when you start breaking that down into smaller pieces, you figure out that the father's supposed to be trained in the home. So if the hot father's missing, we got an issue, right? Why do you think they made sure that we get the fathers out of the black families? Because they held the line. And sometimes they wasn't right, but they held the line. See? What, am I talking about discipleship? Yep. Still talking about it. Discipleship occurs when a person brings another person or persons along in such a way that the teacher imparts the right information while they model the right skill. And this is Tony Evans saying this. I took this quote out. He's right. When you can bring other people along. So this is no insult to anybody. But if you got to keep bringing them to the pastor, you got work to do. Because pastors don't beget sheep. Sheep beget sheep. It's nice to bring them to assembly to hear where, where you're getting your information from. But you, we have to learn as, as believers that, listen, hey, you're my friend. I see you. Let's sit down. Let's walk through this thing. Now, if I need some help because I'm in over my head, call on somebody. But you see, you want to, we talk about church, fill up, fill up the seats. Listen, fill them up with what? Oh, now you're meddling. Fill them up with what? Folks just as, and he said that to them. He said it to the, to the, uh, to the Pharisees, he said, you go over land and sea to make one disciple, and you make them ten times worse than you. That's why you got arenas full of churches with all kind of garbage going on. Oh, see? Okay. All right, I'm going to shut up. I'll be quiet. I ain't going to say nothing. This is why you cannot simply... Become a disciple by showing up to church on Sabbath or Sunday morning. That don't make you a disciple. It doesn't. Worship is an essential component of following Messiah. So when we come to do praise and worship, that's good. That's an essential part. But like knowledge is not the whole picture. Discipleship demands someone to walk beside you. Now. Are we totally gone? Let me show you how much he's given so much. Can I have John 14, please? 14, 15. We got so much help to get this done, but yet we're failing at it. And I'm, and I'm not saying that anybody in here is failing. I'm just saying. We should uh, be better off than what we are in life, right? The thief on the cross made it on his last day, and he was a murderer, and was no good, but because he recognized the, the sacrifice of, of, of Messiah, he made it in, but his life was destroyed. We're talking about living, right? If you keep my commandments, keep going, keep my teaching and instructions, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforting, another, com another comforter that may abide with you forever. So are we by ourselves? So we have our natural teachers, but we also have the paraclete, the one called alongside with you. I just said discipleship requires that somebody walk with you. So we're never alone, right? Keep going. Even the spirit of truth. So what does, what does this paraclete bring? It brings truth. Now, us, 
you, you, we may be off a little bit. But all of us have access to this. Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. And I would say society too. They ain't, they ain't for that. They about they thing. They don't want that. So, but you see him, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you. So he's in you. You've accepted him. He's in you. But watch this. To what measure? To what measure you mature? Because he needs you to do work. So when he's tugging at you, and it will be the Ruach HaKodesh, when he's tugging at you, I need you to get better. I need you to tighten up. I need you to get more of me. The yoke that you said you got, he said, take my yoke upon you. That just puts you in position. Ah, oh yeah. So if, if, if we had the carriage and, the, and you yoke and you yoke the oxen or the horse together, but you never go, they don't move. So you're just in position. I'm yoked with the Lord. Okay, are you moving? Because he's moving. Man, I hope y'all understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> so, <laughs> the issue is not whether or not, whether or not you're going to be disciples. That's not the issue. The issue is who is going to disciple you, the world and society, or you sure? Because you're going to be discipled. You're going to choose a side by default, if nothing else. Amen? Y'all might be quiet. Y'all with me? Watch this. And I'm going to show you how everybody knows how to disciple. Watch this. This is Tony. Tony put this out. This is pretty good. Prime example in the urban communities is drug dealers. They take young people and mold them by giving them the body of information necessary to make a quick dollar, letting, him, letting them walk beside them while they deal, and then sending them on their way into the streets to sell drugs the way they taught them. What is that? It's discipleship. It's the same thing. Let me show you how to do this, young buck. And guess what they do? Meet a need because it's mostly poor. They got a need. Ain't no money. Hey, make a quick buck. Yeah. And this is quicker than working in the grocery store for minimum wage. Right? Some folk, do you know some people last on you? You're sure because the preacher said it's going to be all right. Nah, man. You got to develop, or you just going to be, you, how many know you could be a miserable Christian? Oh, man. What? What you talking about, man? This is what they do. Watch this. I ain't going to leave the drug dealers alone. I added this piece. This ain't Tony. You see the same thing with the hip-hop culture. In both cases, they introduce a body of information or culture. They show you how to work it, but they never tell you the outcome. This is the time now that the, 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 the disciples of Messiah should be showing our young people with all that's being exposed and see how this whole, this whole thing is crashing. Now, who you think is crashing it? Listen, y'all can say anytime he want, that's enough. Okay, that's it. Ain't nobody running the show but him. I don't care what, even with your politics, whatever you want. We were singing a song today, Prince, all of the positions and all that, ain't nobody above his name. Do we believe that or not? Because if we do, we stay the course, and we grow, we develop, and we get better. And then you can help somebody. You may not get to see me or Pastor Barry or one of the other offices, 
you need to be a disciple that can help somebody understand what the scriptures are saying. And you need to Im implicate it and put it in your life, or say application, apply it to your life, live it so that you develop. And over time, you'll see it. I got four minutes. Let's go to this last scripture. Let's go to um, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, 17, 17 and 18. I'm going to close with this piece, and I'm going to continue on. <clears throat> we're going to do this to see exactly what we look like. All right. Let me get there with you. Look at here. <laughs> yeah, I got to go here. get to Corinthians because I want you to hear it from here. Chapter 3. This way you want one of those things to say chapter 3. <laughs> All right. Verse 17. This says, now the Lord is that spirit. Capital S. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Watch this. That's a lot to take in the way that's written. Watch this. Now, Adonai... In this, in this text means the spirit, the spirit. And where the spirit of Adonai is, there is freedom. We say liberty, freedom, freedom to do what? To become a disciple. But now we know that a disciple means to develop so we begin to look like him. And he's using the imagery of a mirror. He says, so all of us, verse 18, with faces unveiled, and we don't make the connection a lot of times, unveiled, see as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What is the glory of the Lord when you look in the mirror? Your transformation. Do you look in the mirror and see that you are not the guy you was five years ago, 20 years ago, but you have developed? That is the glory of God looking in that mirror. Man, y'all missed that one. You got it? That's it. It's him saying, "Woo, man, I am not the guy I used to be. And we are being changed into his very image from one degree of glory to the next by Adonai, the spirit. We got everything we need. Now, the quick on that, because I got a minute, is he used a reference and go back and read it. Moses came off the mountain after learning the Torah and his face was so bright they couldn't look at him. But the, the shine was fading. But he covered his face. So when you get into it and start studying, you're going to see he's saying Moses had his face veiled. So they couldn't see. Yes, it was bright, but they couldn't see it was fading. Meaning that the Torah as it was handled in that time was fading so that we could be unveiled by Yeshua and have a new brightness. Same Torah with the intent of the spirit now written on your heart. And what does that equal? A disciple who has matured and is walking and beginning to look like Messiah. That's what that means. Check it out. Check it out and look at it. If we're not growing, we're missing the boat. 
I'm not saying you're out of the game, but I'm saying you can't be used but so well. Amen? I'm out of time. The focus needs to go back on Yeshua. If it doesn't, then we're missing the boat. And we don't want to miss it here. Not here. Not at, not at this fellowship. We don't want to miss it. We want to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do and we're maturing and growing. That makes everybody's job less. You hear that, Pastor B? Don't be no burnout pastors because we're going to have a bunch of disciples in here who are maturing and growing and taking their rightful place, sheep, begetting sheep, and helping folks out, that we build a network, which is the same as the kingdom of folks that are succeeding in life and got all the help they need. Amen? God bless you.